Hello, everyone, and welcome to the seventh podcast of our Alt Protein Show sponsor interview series. This is Diana Rogers. And I'm Alexander Zox. And we're from Brand First. We were the official design partner of the Alt Protein Show. And today we'll be talking to international flavors and fragrances. That's right. So let's get into this. IFF is a self-described catalyst for discoveries that spark the senses and transform the everyday. International Flavors and Fragrances Incorporated is a leading innovator of scent, taste, and nutrition with over 110 manufacturing facilities, 100 R&D centers, and 33,000 customers globally. They are fueled by a sense of discovery, constantly asking, what if? That passion for exploration drives them to co-create unique products that consumers experience in more than 150,000 unique products sold annually. Their 13,000 member team globally take advantage of leading consumer insights, natural exploration, research and development, creative expertise, and customer intimacy to develop differentiated offerings for consumer products. We were actually invited by IFF to do this podcast at their Flavor headquarters in Dayton, New Jersey. And we had the pleasure of speaking with Adam Jensuk, who is the Global Innovation Program Director of International Flavors and Fragrances. So just a little bit about Adam. He was named Global Innovation Program Director for the Reimagine Protein and Reimagine Modulation programs at International Flavors and Fragrances in 2019. In this role, he is responsible for pioneering technologies that balance and elevate taste experiences for food and beverages that support a healthier lifestyle for consumers. Dr. Jensik holds a PhD in chemistry from Wayne State University with over 35 patents and publications to his name. Owing to his 15 years of experience in R&D and business, he understands the finer points of leading innovation and developing new technologies focused on consumer experiences and expectations. And just a note, this is actually the first podcast that IFF did that was external, so we are very excited um, to be a part of this. And we started our conversation with Adam discussing the Reimagine program. So you had the question about what are the Reimagine programs, right? Yes. And it, quite yeah. simply, those are IFF's big bets, where you right. see the market trend, understanding that these are macro um, things that are you know, consumer demands, drivers, okay. things that we see in the market, and based on our insight as to where we're seeing the market going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we feel that by investing in these areas, we're able to help offer our customers, our clients, uh, products that will meet that that need. So we're talking about protein. So all the big trends. Yeah. Well, it's not even the big trends. It's translating those things into how do we innovate around that and deliver against those needs. So culinary, uh, we're doing protein. Modulation is really about the health and wellness. Uh, we also have naturals and what we call delivery. How do we make a product stable that like you said earlier in a conversation, ensuring that the quality of an ingredient is consistent so that way when the artist put it together, whether the artist is the chef at home or if the artist is the uh, company that's putting a product on the market, they're able to comfortably put it together and feel that they know what this is going to do over time. So mm -hmm. that's really the, the, the crux of it. So we have the six big bets. The six big bets. The six big bets, <laughs> yes. And, and how long have you been doing that particular book? Uh, well, I would say we've launched it uh, at least two years. Internally, we've kind of been developing it probably over, over a little over three years. Oh, wow. So we've been kind of gearing and, and really focusing our energy to make sure that what we do is relevant, not only to the market, but also be stewards for the next trend and, and responding and help predicting what's going to happen in the future. Wow, that's really cool. Can you give an example of, so, because right now it's a bit in the abstract. Sure. You're, you're, you have solutions to f flavors and fragrances. Sure. And how would that actually, so you were talking in ter terminology of an artist putting it together, yeah. being able to rely on its consistency, mm -hmm. but in what way would that operate for ingredients or for product? 
So I'll, I'll take modulation, for instance, as an example. This is where we're trying to, if you understand what's driving the need, it's for a healthier product. You're looking for trust and transparency. So you want to know what goes in there because healthy also means I understand what I'm consuming and at the same time still being exciting. So you don't want to compromise on that experience. So what we would do in that case, one of the ways to healthy, and that's where protein comes in, but also uh, lower sugar, lower salt, lower fat. What can we contribute to enable our clients to do that lower those macro ingredients, make a healthier product that still satisfies the basic desire of something mm -hmm. clean and exciting. And that's kind of where, where it would come together. So there would be a science behind ingredients, how they interact at a fundamental level and how our experts put those together to help formulate what the final uh, product's gonna be. Right, so that's a molecular mm -hmm. level, would that be? In some cases, yes. It's okay. also extracts. So we do do basic science, we have a whole, uh, innovation uh, R&D center in Union Beach, but also in, in Europe, we've uh, a lab in China. So we have a global footprint of where we're tapping uh, experts as well as talent from around the world to really bring it together and develop the next generation of ingredients or technologies to enable that. Right. Sure. Hence why you were at the All Protein Show. That's it. <laughs> but also to not only to showcase why we were there, some of the capabilities bring awareness, but also understand what are the pain points? What are what is what is the challenge here, and how we can be part of that solution mm -hmm. in a way that maybe is not always thought of? Like, mm -hmm. how can flavors help? If you know, there was the one talk, uh, and and pardon if I, I don't remember who the uh, the professor or the doctor was talking about the sustainability, where he took the the gas emissions and was able to convert that. Oh, uh, oh yes, yeah, that was a very interesting, and it really shows the the thought process of moving away from. Uh, uh, you know, uh, agriculture as a feedstock, even though that's a positive way to evolve, but saying, let's take waste products, take beer or wine waste products, and can we convert that to a value added product that can be turned into a consumer goods? Right. So, it, you know, it's pretty fascinating what they what you can do these days. Yeah. And, and, and then where, where can we play in it and understand what is that in? Yeah, that was Dr. Peter Rowe, Deep yeah. Branch. Yes. Yeah, it, so endlessly fascinating that you can, you know, take things that you didn't realize you could take things from, right? Yeah. So thin air or emissions and, yes. and you know, so um, it's pretty, it's pretty like a, much a wild frontier, I would say. Mm -hmm. and, and being aware of that frontier is one of the things that we want to better understand how we play, um, what technologies we need to develop, what are the basic tenants that are critical to make that a viable option in the future? Because we know that's long term. We have the here and now. So as you see the evolution of protein, uh, we've gone from you know the animal based, which we understand all the footprint that it leaves behind from a sustainability standpoint, to the arable land where we're growing crops. But the 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 the, the desire is to say, how can we be fully cyclical? in the way we produce proteins and not only have a more Im a positive impact on a human uh, condition and, and the environment, but also if we were to look at the beyond space exploration and moving beyond the planet, how are you gonna enable that? It's not like you can step out at some point saying, oops, I'm a little short on sugar. I'm gonna go to the local grocery store and pick right. some more up. You're, mm -hmm. you're on your way to Mars. So how do you bring all that together? Right. And those flavors uh, and fragrances from on Earth understand are quite different in space than they yeah. are here on Earth. Oh, so. you, would, you would assume so. And I think, and I'm sure we can probably bring up the, the one research we had done many years ago. That's my previous life a little bit with the fragrance side is to study what is the effect of zero gravity. And right. we were doing experiments with the science program to where we actually were studying what, how a rose grows in zero gravity and what molecules does it produce that's different and then recreate that experience on earth so from one aspect what does zero gravity do but on the other aspect bring the consumer the extraterrestrial experience here on earth so they can appreciate wow this is what a rose or what the smell would be like if i was up in space and who knows at what point we'll be out there but yeah that's the you know that's the dream the it promise could be coming so, quicker than we know yeah. so what does a rose smell like in space <laughs> that's a very good question <laughs> I'm not a very good smeller, so that was one of the oh. questions that you had earlier. Yeah. About. You could be not a good taster, but still not a good you know, smeller. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it's like 
really the, the height of imagination being combined with science. I didn't yeah. realize that that's what you did, that you had the rose bloom in space and you were actually monitoring every aspect of it and then reimagining it on, you know, exactly. with gravity, yeah. but pretending like gravity wasn't there. Yeah, and then yeah. recreate the, the, from the fingerprint that you figure out because you're really measuring it as a fingerprint. Right. And we do that with all kinds of other things. Culinary, we have chefs here, we have kitchens, we, we, we're cooking creating, growing in our Union Beach facility. We have a whole greenhouse with all kinds of uh, very exotic plants, uh, wow. flowers, different cycles. And we even grow things hydroponics to where we're saying, okay, what if you change the nutritional profile? What does that change in the way the rose or, or a flower produces? What aromatic components? And then how can we recreate that in a different pathway that's more sustainable, that's more available for the average consumer than trying to grow this stuff on a on a water <laughs> medium right. based. So is it equal parts analysis and then you're executing that analysis in a format that encompasses, you know, fragrance or flavor? Um, I think probably if I'm looking at it, it's the execution is the harder part it's of it. It's the harder part. Okay. It, clearly, because you can identify the molecule, but that's where the expertise comes in. I, before you coined it close to it, it's a, it's a science and art at the same time. Mm -hmm. right? You can come up with, okay, this is the fingerprint, this is what it looks like, but then it's just a call it a digital image. You got to bring that to life, make the subtle nuances. And as if you change, how do you modify that to hit the emotional aspect? Because emotions are not digital yet, mm -hmm. right? And and trying to translate <laughs> that fingerprint into an emotional response, you need to have that that person behind it saying, okay, I think it needs a little bit more of X right. and then less of Y, even though the fingerprint says something The computer different. can't tell you that. It can't predict <laughs> it. It's a close approximation, but right. it's not perfect. Right. So you're going from then digital when a computer's involved to analog, really analog in the yeah. greatest sense because it's our senses that are Correct. interpreting it. Yes. Right. Okay. Yes. So there must be some tricks to that as well. Um, tricks, trends, predictions, but it's a lot of it comes back down to expertise. And this is one of the few areas that you, it's not easy to substitute the human factor, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's like culinary aspects. You can follow a recipe, but we were talking about making pierogi earlier. Yes. All of us make a slight <laughs> different variation of it, but following the recipe, it just doesn't work that Sometimes way. Sometimes you, you gotta do feel. You gotta right. feel it out. And that you, you can't predict easily. Right, it informs you of a direction of your creativity, but then you've got to go for broke. Go for broke. <laughs> yes. That's right. Gotcha. And so, it's interesting. So what um, would be like one of the rarest flavors or fragrances? Well, that... I, I don't know if there's anything that I can kind of quantify as a rare flavor or fragrance. That you've I ever think... created, I mean, as a company? Anything? Yeah, I mean, the, the Space Rose was one of the yeah, more yeah, unique for sure. ones. Certain. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's not every day you can grow stuff out there in space. Um, from a rarity standpoint, in terms of f f flavors, it's that's a difficult question because it's really understanding the culinary cues. There's right. really no truly rare flavor out there. Because all of us are eating and consuming it in some way, right? Mm -hmm. So we're familiar with what, what a caviar would be taste like at some point. We, we've experienced that. We're talking about herring earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're familiar with, you know, especially the world, it's such a small thing. There, I don't think there's anything rare. I think what's rare about it is trying to understand what is the key element in that cooking technique, in that taste experience that you need to have in order to replicate its authenticity if you're going to go into a uh, alternative meat program uh, a platform or some other product so how do you retake it out from that element take what's good about it what's consumers will be excited and translate that into another medium right because so that, obviously you're essentially trying to mimic what's already out there exactly you're trying to mimic or use that in combinations of other things. So I'll use an example. We've done analysis on certain varietals of lemons, and we weren't looking at your traditional, uh, you know, terpenes that you find or the typical molecules that you're looking in there. And this is published work. We've done also looking at the sulfur molecules, and you're thinking sulfur. I'm thinking. Oh well, sulfur. It's onion. It's it's meaty. It's okay. it's really kind of heavy. 
But those have such a low level that really mm. add to a nuance that you don't appreciate. And at the same time, taking a chicken and finding out that if you're cooking a chicken and frying it, you can find the molecular fingerprint that could be replicating something for a lemon lime beverage. Why? Because hmm. some of the same basic chemistry that happens at the level of a fruit that happens in the chicken, which is strange enough, can be translated and inspires the combination of those, let's call molecules or ingredients put together. And as our artists or flavorists or perfumers recreate that experience, they're, they're taking that, that knowledge of how to put these things together and, and try to deliver on it. Mm. So, wow. It, so completely unrelated, but coming together. And, and that's a crazy yeah. part of it. It's the wacky the wackiness yeah, yeah. of the sciences that, that there is that sky's the limit in terms of thoughts and you can find inspiration in unusual places. Yeah, I was thinking when you were saying that, I was imagining that shoelaces would be tied together, right? But mm -hmm. the potential is like this incredible potential in what is hanging there. Mm -hmm. And then actually finishing it is the master stroke of identifying and evoking it. Yes. Right? Yes. That's, I mean, that's, that's kind of a, a moment of poetry. Yes. So do you have music that <laughs> no. plays when no. you're making flavors and fragrances? Uh, some of the team does. I mean, I'm a hardcore scientist. My background yes. is uh, chemistry. I'm an organic synthetic chemist. For me, gotcha. I think molecules. I was a repressed artist. I could only go beyond stick figures when I talk about <laughs> it. But it, 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 they're, they find inspiration all kinds of ways. I bet. Yeah, that, I bet. Sure. Know? And it could be family. It could be people. It could be the environment, plants. Mm. You know, if you walk around this building or any of our other sites, you'll 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 see little nuggets of it. You know, you'll have somebody that has a little bobblehead of uh, you know, I don't know, it would be even a Deadpool or or mm -hmm. something else in there, and that. That's that's the quirkiness that in, inspires them, and right. and that's where they channel their energy right. from. Right, well, poetry is not exclusive. No, it's kind of like the design industry too that yeah. we're involved in, right? Yeah. You, you find inspiration in places you wouldn't even expect, really. So sure, it happens. Um, but you kind of answered this question. I was wondering if you create proprietary um, flavors and fragrances. I know you're more on the flavors side. Yes. Um, for clients, or do you tend to? use similar uh, uh, flavors for, you know, similar products? Well, you know I, you know, we'll develop base technologies, but everything we do is really tailored and, and really keeping that customer in mind, right? Because you're thinking of what is their brand? What is their clients? How do we engage? And it's their platform. I think of it this way as a painting palette, right? They have the canvas. We have some paints. They have some paints. We have a paintbrush. They have a paintbrush and what masterpiece they want to create is a collaborative effort and not one masterpiece matches the other masterpiece. So for us, it's really about our expertise, our technologies, working together with the client to deliver on what they're trying to say to the market and deliver on the consumer experience. So in, in essence, our you know proprietary, yes, it's putting it together, it's designed for them, but it's also the innovation of the technology behind it to mm. enable us to effectively do that for mm. them. Of course. Now, and then what happens when it comes to, say, intellectual property? Do they own that flavor that you create for them, or is it... Well, it, that we have an IP strategy. Yeah, yeah, no, we have an IP strategy around that, and, sure. and you know, if I'm kind of, kind of queuing up what we were saying, it simply comes down to... Based on the strategy, the nature of the relationship, we, we, we kind of work together with our clients, well, what's the best fit, right? Because right. these are partnerships, they're relationships, and we, we want, we respect all of that stuff, and they're bringing something to the table, we're bringing something to the table, and it's really kind of co-creating something. Right. And that's what makes it unique. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How, how much, okay, so speaking from the plant-based side of things, sure. now the science has gotten to a point where there's an emulation of the actual taste of meats like Impossible Burger and Beyond Burger to those two seem to really be, you know, uh, fascinated with that and articulating sure. it in different ways. Yeah. But so <clears throat> their direction is really having this plant based product that evokes uh, eating an actual burger yeah. that's meat based. But there's an opportunity, clearly, and initially, I think, with soy-based products that it wasn't necessarily about trying to emulate meat, right? Mm -hmm. But evoking, maybe, or bringing out what 
the flavor of tofu is, mm. or tempeh, or these different things identified and, and just appreciated for what yeah. they are on a culinary level. Sure. Okay. So I guess there's a lot of room there, and there's a lot of room for invention and innovation, yeah. Yeah. and clearly you would be in a position to affect that. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, as just an end user and not being really informed of the science nature, the yeah. parts of it, I just think of, you know, if I took carrots mm -hmm. and I were to, you know, bring them down to a, a smaller format mm -hmm. and, and bring something to, to combine them. And so let's say we have a carrot patty. Yeah. So we, we're, it's going to taste like carrot. Sure. Right? Okay. So then we have this other side of things where we can, you know, bring something out or articulate a different thought sure. and different flavor and smell. Mm -hmm huge sweeping possibilities yeah. are there any that you could speak to that you've worked on that you would say um express this mm -hmm. or that bring this out or any um, of that i mean I, I think each each example is very unique you know you get on I, I think it comes down to what is the motivation for using a carrot for instance are you doing it because you want to have the nutritional value of the carrot in a lot of cases soy was convenient and it was one of the first agricultural products that offered you a higher protein content and a good yield so that was the reason why at least for some companies the motivation to use that as a medium so the, uh, the motivation there was to provide a nutritional base that's not sourced from an animal product right. yes okay so once you take that, then, then you ask, well, what are you trying to achieve? Well, what is the experience? Am I taking beans and trying to say, I'm going to create these beans and make a scrambled egg-like experience? Then, okay, how, what is part of a scrambled egg experience? Right. Are you trying to entice the person that may want to say, you know what, I love scrambled eggs, but on some days I want to move away from this and try something but not compromise on that experience in some way? then that's your motivation. If you want to offer somebody that has a total vegan lifestyle and says, you know what, I do want to know what my friends are talking about, but I don't want to compromise on that core belief or a philosophy, then can I get something that closely approximated so I can relate? So it really comes down to the motivation behind those things. So in, in the case of your example, you know, you can. You know, if you want to use it as a base for a nutritional value, then the question is, how do I mitigate some of the flavor or taste attributes that don't contribute to that vision so you're just trying to mask something and then what qualities do I want to bring out more by masking because sometimes you can suppress something and it actually makes the other attributes more more vi uh, more pronounced and then where can I add the additional ingredients because it won't be just a carrot patty and expect it to taste like a burger right there has to be something else there you have texture sure. how does it work together with tomato what kind of burger do you want to do you're looking for angus you're looking for a little meat a little chopped meat and so it really starts beginning understanding mm. what are you trying to what what is your vision and how do you want to get there? And what are the core values that are underpinning that, that, mm. that journey? So it's really a process of discovery and, and learning what the client wants to achieve and yes. then figuring out how to get there together. Yes. Yeah. Right. I, I, I think vegetarian, we've kind of touched on this in, in a few of the other podcasts, the, the beginnings of, of that being something that actually was a format people wanted to eat, you know, in the 70s, let's just say, right? Yeah. So there was really, there were very few options. And that's kind of, I guess, the larger point is that today we're in a brave new world where the options are just expanding um, tremendously. Okay. And, and also, too, is people's motivations are different, right? Yes. Some of it is you're looking at a high protein content that is viewed as healthier for you, cleaner. And not cleaner from an environmental standpoint, but you know, starting to kind of pin into the right amino acid content or the right thing. And it's, it's a diet nutritional motivation. Obviously, the sustainability is something that 
um, a good portion of people are aware of and that's also important but that's a right. philosophical underpinning same thing as a vegetarian it's whether it's a religious or some other philosophical underpinning but it's also being able to offer something that's nutritional that's healthy and is an alternative to what's currently on the market and I think that's where you're starting to see the broader appeal for proteins you yes. go to a convenience store yeah. and the first thing front of label oh, 12 grams of protein 8 grams of protein and these mm. quick convenient whether you grab it as a bar you chew it as a you know a jerky or jerky-like product, or you're drinking it in some kind of beverage consumable, you're picking it for multiple reasons, but doesn't matter because those products offer something for that spectrum of people, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does any of this um, actually rest with or lean on nutritive properties in, in the way that you enhance flavors so that something would have like vitamin C to it just by the, just the nature of what you're... Well, I, I think we're really focused on the on the ingredient side. We're really focused on the flavor experience and how does that complement. Sure. Now, whether our ingredients may have additional nutri nutritional properties, that's something that you know depends on what ingredient. We don't necessarily that's that's not our core motivation. Mm -hmm. Our core okay. motivation is the flavor part of it. Gotcha. In some cases, efficiently, you can get the nutrients in different ways. Not to say we don't have products that do that, but right. it's that's not just an our, extra benefit. That's an extra benefit for yeah. sure. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and I'm sure it's different for every client that you work with, but you know, typically how long would it take to develop um, a flavor for a particular product? I uh, mean, it, I'm sure it runs the gamut. But it I'm totally saying, runs the yeah. gamut. Yeah, you have some that are quick. I want to put something out there and let the consumer tell me whether they like it. And then you have others that are saying, we're going to be really systematic about this. We're going to vet it and very empirical approach to it. So you can have it right. as quickly as, you know what, send me your one or two best uh, technologies or your formulations that you think will work on X, Y, Z. And they're like, wow, this is fantastic, good to go. And next you know, they're launching it in the next, uh, you know, the next month and you're getting orders. <laughs> and then you have ones that for years we're, we're working with them. And, it, and it's good because it gives us also an appreciation of what does it take, you know, from a mega brand that yeah. wants to change over to a, a, a small regional brand that just wants to make a, a, a you know, an unmet need for, for, for where they know is home. Right. Yeah, so some of the flavors would take possibly the length of War and Peace. Yes. Right. <laughs> yes. And then others, maybe, yeah, that. Yeah. So much. And a lot of that, too, is also what, you know, getting to that perfect masterpiece, right? In some cases, you get it on a few goes. In other cases, it's like, hmm, I want this and I want that. And there's so many different factors that go into that as they decide, you know, as the client has, their medium may change. Oh, we're sourcing this protein from here, but mm. we're now going to this. And that completely changes the palate. And it could also come from, yeah, we want to go... You know, in this fruity direction, but we're like, ah, you know what, maybe we're going to go more in a citrus direction. So there's some of that also comes into play. So do you interpret somebody's request ever utilizing the tools such as like a mood board, mm -hmm. for example, because I'm just thinking in our design process, it's this, you know, trying to give the client kind of what they're imagining first, mm -hmm. you know, literally writing their words down, then delivering aspects of it in different ways, mm -hmm. right? And then there's, so there's this interaction and conversation. Yeah. So it sounds like with some clients, they come and taste and they say, mm, I want a little bit more of this or a little bit more of that. Yeah, it's the full spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Some will be very hands-on, involved, they'll taste, they'll guide to say, hey, can you do more of this and a little less of this? And others like, I just, wow, this is great, we're done, we'll go, right? Yeah. It, it, it's hard to predict. But that's the fun part of it, right? It right. comes back down right. to the variability of, uh, and it, it's, it's truly some, a new challenge every day because even within the customers and the clients that we work with, they may have a, an objective that is something you can't predict, and they say, well, we just want to do this. Right. Mm -hmm. If you go and you yeah. try. Right. Personalities right. prevail. It is. Right. Yeah. It's a lot of that's driven by personality and then also corporate objectives where yeah, sure. they may have a, a goal in mind that they're looking for us to help them achieve that goal in a certain way. Right. That's yeah. where you, yeah, that's definitely your sweet spot. Yeah. That's what you're there for. Um, yeah. how, how many flavors would you say are natural versus, say, synthetic or, you know? Well, it depends also on the market. Right. Uh, you would find in the Western market here in the U.S., there's a definitely a strong pull for natural, uh, non-GMO, uh, organic, compliant, right. certified. Exactly. So, so that 
a good portion of our portfolio of our technologies available fit that. In fact, from our naturals, we are, I would say, probably 80% of our portfolio from just a general ingredient, I'm talking more on the flavor side, is, is inspired or part of uh, uh, natural, simply because that's what the, the market's looking for. Right. The synthetics are there. You, can, you have two types of synthetics, one that are actually nature inspired. Meaning you're just recreating what nature is, but in a more, let's say, efficient way, a pathway that you're not extracting it from the plant or botanical. And then you have a total new to the world, artificial, something that you know, you've created and said, wow, this does this. Um, we have a portfolio there because they also fit economic needs. So you have certain markets that are looking for something simple that is affordable, that's convenient, and it depends on our clients' needs. But mm -hmm. in order to be effective, we have to be able to have you know the full tool belt to offer all range of things. Absolutely. But if you're asking what our companies focus in, and I think with our, our recent acquisition, there's a strong commitment to natural, and natural is gonna be an underpinning for everything that we create moving forward, understanding that natural also means it needs to be affordable, right? Right, absolutely, yeah. yes, mm -hmm. yeah, of yeah. course. Yeah. I know you had a few flavor, or, uh, yeah, flavors to try at the show, mm -hmm. that we tried, and those were natural, correct? They All were, natural, vegan, was, and, yeah. and designed for proteins, because that's one of the interesting things too, is that, you know, especially if you're talking about a beverage, your medium is water, and some acid, and some other things like that. Now you're talking something very complex, you have proteins, they bind things not only to each other, but you have the way that a flavor is expressed and released is also impacted by the type of protein and how much. So those flavors, based on our experience, we're doing anal you know, the fingerprinting, what's released, what's not, are designed to work best in that medium. So that way you're getting the, the experience you're expecting. So. You and know, it was truly amazing. You yeah. had the grilled versus the smoky. Yeah. Uh, uh, it was roasted, I think. Roasted, yeah. roasted. And, and then, then the two types of vanillas. Right. Yeah. Would it be fair to say that when you profile a flavor of fragrance that you're fine, the way that you're articulating it is really a, um, a I'm losing my, my, uh, my, my, not my train of thought, just a particular word, an algorithm. Mm hmm Oh, I don't know if it's necessarily an algorithm. Um, you're, you can do some predictions and some base notes you can expect, but there's also an expertise there. Mm -hmm. And oh, well, sure. you have a lot of trained and highly trained. I mean, th this is an art. It's an apprenticeship, essentially, because we both on the flavor and fragrance science, it's not like you necessarily go to school to be this at a university. Mm -hmm. The company and IFF invests into uh, internal school and apprenticeship and you make your way through the ranks huh. as you learn through customer, client, dealing with colleagues, and then also being exposed to these new technologies to really learn to say, how do they work? What emotion do they evoke? What flavor do they uh, convey? And how you put those two those things together to create what you're trying to uh, target for, for your clients. Wow, that's, that's very interesting. Yeah. That's, it reminds me, what is the, the terminology for somebody that gets to a certain level when they become an expert on wines? You know, they go through this Sommelier. whole, well, sommelier, and master then there's sommelier. even master, right? Yeah, masters, and principles. Yeah, we have, we have that both on the flavor and fragrance side of it. So there is that, right, that's... that ranking seniors and juniors, associates. Mm. Yeah, there's a whole, there's a whole hierarchy as they learn. Wow. Yeah. And it must take some uh, some doing to like know how, like how to really like get those nuanced notes yeah. out of something and, and detect them. Yeah, and it's practice, yeah. hands-on mentorship, and it's passing on that craft and that science from one generation to the other. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is so there's such thing as super taster. Yeah. Is that also a super smeller? There are. Right, so if you think on a, a receptor based level, right. and from you have people that are probably more sensitive and they can pick out subtle nuances. They may not be able to translate, okay, this smell is this particular molecule. That's where through training they learn some of those aspects. But yes, there are people that can pick out more um, subtleties in a flavor or in an aroma than others do. What's true is we all have olfactory receptors and we have taste receptors right how many of them what how in tune we are with them 
is completely different. It's like everybody else is very, you know, genetically we're, we're the same but yet different. So mm -hmm. it'll vary. Mm -hmm. And when our um, flavorists or perfumers put things together, they're the they're the super tasters. There's a training. Not everyone can go through this apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. You have to show some of that basic ability to taste or smell, or in the case of flavors, you kind of have to do a little bit of both because mm -hmm. you're you're tasting on the tongue, but also through the aromas that are in your mouth that add to the full experience. It requires a certain ability. <laughs> you have to have that ability uh, uh, and, and be proficient at it. Yeah. And then from there, can you translate what does that mean to a molecule, a ingredient, or a technology and recreate that again? Mm. Yeah. So there's a skill part of that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. There, you actually, I remember Diana had a kit that yes. you had that had different fragrances in it. Yeah. and It was for when you were tasting wine and, and, yeah. and identifying those notes. Um, yeah. And referencing it, yeah. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And honestly, it, it, if you smelled something <laughs> first, then you could taste it. Yeah. It, you know, it's, it's almost like leading the witness a little bit. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Not when I smell that. Yes. I need that. <laughs> Well, but that's interesting said is we also do a lot of sensory and consumer insights where we bring in, we have trained mm -hmm. panels, so people that are not uh, skilled in the art, but are specialized in particular nuances that we're trying to understand a little bit more. And they'll come in and we have a whole team that will train them on these reference points, whether something is bitter or whether we're looking for something woody. These are the key uh, characteristic ingredients that are associated with that description and then use those panels to help guide where our creations are going so there's that sensory aspect so it's beyond just the technical expert because again it's that super taster mm. or that super smeller may pick up something that the normal consumer may not and you need to be able to calibrate what you're creating with how it's going to be expressed to a larger portion of the population hmm. right Weren't you telling me, Alex, that there's like really seven senses? Of yeah, there were. Five? So in my brief research <laughs> this morning, <laughs> I came across, besides all of the, the normal and, you know, things that we consider to be um, the five senses. our senses, there's also pro-perception. Okay. So that's the perception of awareness of the position and movement of the body. Okay. So I was going to actually ask that as a question. So the way that we understand our, you know, geography, I'm mm -hmm. located here, has to do with, in large part, I would imagine, how we smell things mm -hmm. or even taste them. So, it's, I mean, it would have to involve the other senses. Sure. Right? Uh, you know, I mean, there might be an innate ability for somebody to know what their direction is. Mm. But still, I would imagine you could throw them off by, by smell. Sure. Um, and then the other was vestibular, relating to the vestibule, particularly that of the inner ear, or more generally to the sense of balance. Okay. Sounds so, like they both have a similar yeah. uh, sense of self and awareness. Right. And so... Like an environmental mm -hmm. aspect to it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really... Pretty much, I feel like that's over my head at the moment. Mm -hmm. I will say, <laughs> um, especially because you know we lead with. So you wake up in the morning, and mm -hmm. the first thing that I like to smell is coffee. Mm -hmm. Of course, many do, yeah. you know, and that elicits a response yeah. before I even taste it, before I even have the caffeine and mm -hmm. all of that, and then we go through the day like that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like walking through the city in the summertime sometimes is not as pleasant as the winter. Yeah. Even though it's colder in the winter, but the summer, sometimes you can get faced with things that you wish you didn't. That's correct. <laughs> right. That's for sure. You know, um, but besides that kind of unappetizing talk, a, I, yeah. I think, um, you know, we, we had a lot of questions. I actually wanted to refer to something that I was sent by Olivia Fox Cabane. Because I, I, you know, said to her, we're going to be here. And do you have any questions you would like to uh, throw our way? So, Watch out. Just throw them well, This is really cool. Okay. <laughs> because, um, you know, she says that, uh, you know, flavors and fragrances will be critical to future food systems as we move closer to home printing. Mm -hmm. So the, the, are you working right now on any modules, cartridges for 3D food was, was the first question. Uh, well, without divulging a lot, there yes. are areas that we're, we're reviewing in that space. Where does that come in and how does that play in? How would we play in that space? Right. Right? Yeah. So, so there, to say that we're not looking at it is not true. But to say how much we're doing, I can't 
Right. You know, no, I understand. Be able that. to kind of share where we are with that, but you can extrapolate if you're thinking about the future foods and and again back to can the printing be back to our space analogy if that's going to enable space travel where you can actually print out the meal and still have the meal that you're really excited about yeah, it kind of makes sense right so right yeah i mean even pl so if you went so far as to say that planetary atmosphere sorry no, no. would change the way that things taste and smell you'd have to literally change how that worked right, right. So, but back to Olivia. So she said the day will come when, for any meal, one just places one's finger uh, print on the family 3D food printer, yeah. and the printer will deliver a perfectly tailored, medically iterated, um, medication iterated, supplements added, piping hot meal on your plate in minutes, right? It's like in Star so. Trek. Yeah, right? you just go to <laughs> the uh, yeah, yeah, it's exactly you just go what right there, and you just it's, get it from yeah. the replicator. So then, do you envision someday the rollout? of new uh, flavors and fragrances to be akin to today's perfume rollouts. Ads with uh, Try, IFF's new sizzling pork flavor compatible <laughs> with all major food printers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's giving me some ideas. And it sounds yeah. like that yeah. you don't really necessarily market yourself through yourself, but others. Yeah, so, yeah. We're, we're, right. we're an enabler, right? We, yes. we help enable that end, and that's where our contributions to that space and that's where our strength and our energy has been in focus we enable the clients that want to do that position that have the name have the prestige to to really bring that forward now you know whether it's powered by inside or anything else along those lines we'd like to you know we like to kind of hope that that's an exciting thing but we're, we're happy to see the success in the market and being part of that success through our client is really where, where what drives and motivates uh, the, with the company or I know my colleagues in that respects. So being behind the scenes and the enabler, that's that's, right that's, that's the cool part of it because yeah. you can enable a lot of things right. and you're not managing products already on the market. You're, you're, you're building the next generation of what's next. So then here's a here's a different question because I'm just thinking you you are being an enabler you have a great catalog of things so you have a great understanding of different flavors and fragrances why they happen but like let's just talk about vanilla for example mm -hmm. so let's look at miss in place right I think I'm not pronouncing that correctly for the French miss en place whatever <laughs> we'll just do the best we can and it would you have a way in which when you're starting to talk about creating a flavor or fragrance that you have certain basic things that you build upon yeah. that helps you to convey and get to the point yeah where you tie the shoelaces yeah no so the, there's obvious building blocks right yes. there's commonalities that are there i think when you talked about the two vanillas that we showed at the show fundamentally they're built, built off of vanillin, right? The main ingredient of vanilla. But what makes them different between the marshmallow and the romi is the rest of the fingerprint. All those other molecules that are characteristic of that type of, uh, that type of vanilla or that vanilla experience. And from there, to your point, well, the block is there. Where we go from that is where we leverage our expertise uh, our experience and our technologies to, to deliver on that. Mm. Right. And I, I'm going to ask this, but you're probably going to tell me you can't <laughs> divulge too much, but what kind of testing then do you do on on the flavors as you know you, you develop them? I mean, are there certain um, ways of, of testing the viability you know, of, a, of a flavor? We, we do consumer. Yeah. So like I said okay. before, we have a sensory and consumer insight. So we're actually taking our own internal teams tell us what you think a descriptive analysis we have a whole sensory and consumer insights that really do a strict um, uh, methodology to gain that information we go to outside consumers so we ask we have consumer panels both on the flavor and fragrance so the easiest way to taste the test it is really with with people with people <laughs> because in the end that's what are going to consume and, it, and we're not talking about testing from 
and the, the safety and all that other stuff. That that stuff is done early on. We right. have strict protocols. We're, and the beauty of it is we're taking it from food, right? So if the food has a history of human consumption, well, most likely it's safe. And right. then go from the, and that aspects. We don't have... Especially if it's a natural. It's component. a natural. And that's also the reason why we go towards that program and that, mm-hmm. that, that platform in that direction. But to answer your question, we use... Our analytical understanding, so we do empirical analysis of what this is and how it's constructed, and then see how that translates to the human experience Mm -hmm. through panels, and panels not only in the United States, but globally, because culturally people have different palettes, and how do we cater to those palettes? The better we understand that, Mm -hmm. the more successful we can to offer products that fit Mm. the promise. That is a good point. I mean, you are an international company, so... And so we have panels all over the world, down in, in uh, South America, in Europe, mm. in Asia, all to cover those different culinary and cultural palettes. I can't remember the name of the companies right now, but there's, for example, uh, a wine that is being molecularly recreated. So okay. it's not actually from the grapes. Mm-hmm. It's the chemistry of what the, the palate is. Mm-hmm. And I just find that to be, you know, incredible, mm-hmm. odd, strange, interesting, all yeah. those things, right? Yeah. I haven't had the pleasure of trying that, like, you know, here's Chateaubriand or whatever, you know? <laughs> but, I mean, what, what does that say about the level of technology that is coming into play now for, you know, things such as wine, but also even in the alternative proteins? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's evolving, and that's really what it's saying. Where before we could only analyze a fingerprint to one dimension, we're now three, four, five dimensions deep. And I used the example of the lemon earlier that we had, where before we wouldn't be able to find those very minute molecules at such a low threshold that your nose picks it up but no instrument can pick it up and you're like I know it's in there yeah. it's like that commercial it's in there <laughs> and and you're able to now identify and discern what it is hmm. and it's just science evolving the, the level of detection from an analytical uh, for the needs it's just well, yeah. it makes it, it enables us and we're, fundamentally we do basic research and that helps us Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is that is that analysis also can that be attributed to computers? So like artificial intelligence? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and that helps too, right? Wow. And we're okay. we're in that space and continue to evolve. You have models, you can also try to predict what you're looking for, and then you go in and if it's wrong, then you feed that information and it just becomes smarter. Right? Right. And so as we're gaining this information and data, we're able to input both the good, the bad and the ugly and really develop the next generation of as it becomes better and better mm. and a useful tool. Yes, very complex. Would you say that the plant-based industry takes more finesse than other categories no. when it comes to flavors? No, I don't think it takes more finesse. I mean, they all have unique uh, challenges. I mean, dairy, for instance, it's also a high-protein product. And so I don't think it, it's more finesse. Just I, different it, it, different challenges, I, yeah. and depending on what experience you're trying to recreate, I, I think right now if I'm looking at the alternative protein space, there's still that that almost that uh, that heart string of do I try to recreate something that's a meat like, mm-hmm. or try to make something that's completely different because you know what the person that's eating this is not really may have not even experienced meat at some that's point. That's so true. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So but, it's who you're trying to cater to and if you are trying to convince somebody then what is the strategy and i think that's where we're still seeing the full dynamic but makes it interesting and fun right oh yeah definitely i I, i'm imagining you get to try a lot of of i'm beginning to so it's uh that's the fun part just exploring and i'll explore you know with our clients but also go into the market that's the best way to test the product what people are saying and one of the I recall a uh, my experience on the fragrance side many moons ago was advised to if you want to really understand a fragrance and what people's reaction are go to a department store <laughs> stand there watch smell and listen to what people are experiencing both from the fine fragrance and then go from that depart from that department store to a 
um, a, a grocery store and now go into the functional products. You talk about soaps and detergents and listen and you hear and who's picking what and why. And then really get that, that feel for it. So in the end, you got to still understand who you're creating for and what are they looking for. What, what means important to them. Right. Like you said, the public is really the best test, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. So here's a weird idea, <laughs> or maybe not so weird, but I'm just thinking in terms of the delivery method and how we receive these sensorily, you know? Is it, is it a reach to say, or I would imagine that, so perfume is not made to be tasted, mm -hmm. right? And certain things that you taste aren't meant necessarily to be smelled. Mm -hmm but they kind of enhance and evoke each other. Yeah, so just to be very clear too, yes. when, you're, when you're talking about taste, there's two parts of taste. One where your taste bud is actually tasting things, yes. and then what you're smelling. So vanilla, you're more smelling it than actually tasting it mm -hmm. on your tongue. Mm -hmm. wow. So okay. in that combination, it's basic taste is really salt, sweet, umami, bitter, and sour. You pinch your nose, and if you can still taste something, that's your basic tastes. Mm -hmm. The aroma is what brings it together. So what you're talking about is exactly what we're trying to evoke, using the basic taste in combination with the right aromas to influence what, what we perceive and how is that considered desirable or not. Right. Right. But So you can walk into a room and smell something, okay. Yeah. Would you ever be able to walk into a room mm -hmm. and taste something? You would potentially associate that smell with something that tastes. And I'll use an example. When you were smelling the vanilla, right? You, mm -hmm. Were you at the... Uh, were yeah, you we were both there, yes. The what was one of the first things that you thought when you smelled the vanilla? Well, the first mm -hmm. one was, to me, the buttery rum, the baking vanilla that mm -hmm. I associate with. Mm -hmm. The second one had a sweeter smell, almost like candy. Mm -hmm. So now you're describing sweet, right? Right. Yeah. But those are just aromas. But sweet is associated with sugar, the taste of sugar. Right. Sure. Like a sugar sweet, syrupy sweet. But you're smelling it. So you see how the brain is associating that aroma with a taste and signaling to mm -hmm. you that something is sweet. So to answer your question, in essence, you are experiencing something that is associated with a take and evoking that response and that emotion associated with it. Baking, you're thinking of a cookie. Right. You're almost tasting that cookie. Mm -hmm. If you walk into a movie theater, why they used to pump in the popcorn the smell. Popcorn. Right. right, because now all of a sudden you're, wow, I'm, I'm not only hungry, but I can almost taste that popcorn, that saltiness on my tongue, and that evokes a, 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 a not only nostalgia, but a, a desire saying, hmm, hey, you know what, I want to experience this. Right, and it's such a familiar it's, smell, and it's like, that's exactly. why I associate that taste with it. But it's all going to the receptors in your, your brain, your neurons, right? Well, you're, you're, the receptors are in your nose, your mouth, or throughout your uh, uh, industrial... Uh, 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 a GI tract, so you yeah, get okay. ingestion and, and stuff because the receptors are all around. Your brain, it sends a signal to your brain. Right. But are those signals, th this is like what I was trying to say or ask, is yeah. the signals from the nose yeah. or the mouth, are those interpreted in the same place in the brain? That's a good question. I don't know exactly uh, where they're interpreted. Uh, in terms of that, that's not my area of expertise. As you say, you mean you're not like a neuroscientist? No, no, not a neuroscientist. I'm just a simple chemist here. Um, yeah. But but you, there is actually, um, it, it definitely does hit the emotional sense of it. Yeah. Right. Because sure. when you think of it from an evolutionary standpoint, you want smell and taste to reinforce a behavior. Mm -hmm. The reason why we like sugar, salt, and fat was because it meant survival of the species. Why do we have so many receptors? We have about 25 to 30 bitter receptors. It was to defend ourselves from eating something that, well, was poisonous and bitter meant poison. If you smelled something sour, that triggered to you that, well, it's probably spoiled and not good for me. So those are evolutionary cues to help ensure the survival of species. And that's reinforced throughout time and that kind of drives our not only emotional response but our behaviors and that's mm -hmm. really all it comes down to. Mm -hmm. Right. I wonder if most shamans were super tasters. Could be. 
Yeah. <laughs> I you know, no I mean, you know, it just... It sounds plausible, Yeah, right? it's, I mean, because yeah. they they were teaching everyone in yeah. the tribe, you know, whatever, in the collective group of people that they were responsible for, that this is bitter and then maybe you should stay away from it. Yeah. But then why do I love so much bitter things like Broccoli Rob? Like, we've just learned to understand that those things are okay to yeah. eat and now enjoy in yeah. that, and our palates become more sophisticated as we evolve. Sure. And you associate certain bitterness with nutritional, but you're taught that. I mean, think about it. Did you like the broccoli when you were a kid? Right, especially uh, broccoli raw. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think, honestly, my romance with vegetables started when I understood that I could cook them or eat them raw and not have them from frozen bags. Well, mm. that's true. A huge difference, yeah. you know, um, seeing something grow in a garden because yeah. you have that whole memory associated with it as well. It's like you're yeah, because now you've tender. invested in it. Yeah, yeah. invested in it. You have indeed. equity in that yes. in that yeah. in that output, and you want to see it through. What what did I produce? And at that point, that fruit or vegetable is never ugly. It's just tasty. Yeah, equity in the vegetable. Yes. <laughs> Oh, my, my wife's the same way. We yeah. grow tomatoes in the backyard, and I have a couple of hot peppers. I, I managed to catch ghost peppers, too, and it's like mm. those taste hotter or better, or the tomato soup from that tomato is a lot better because we grew it ourselves. Right. <laughs> Always does. <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> but wow. to your point, I think as you get older and you eat different things and you learn to appreciate them, you almost grow to love them. It's not something that's in, innate no. necessarily, you know? And there's certain bitterness or stringency that's associated with some of these foods because now you're thinking there's an antioxidant and you know that that flavonoid or whatever um, uh, uh, natural product is giving it that's healthy for you but it may not necessarily taste as good. So you're starting to learn those responses but those are in most cases learned or appreciated as you mentioned earlier um, as you uh, mm -hmm. kind of invest in the time to... to right. To produce something right right exactly is yeah. there any particular flavor that you can think of that is difficult to capture oh. more than others <laughs> yeah that's a that that's a challenging question yeah. I, I I think really to bring the authenticity we're always striving to get it better so you know if I can give you the the easy answer they're all difficult <laughs> um, right but the, in reality, it comes down to it's about the authenticity. The difficulty is not trying to recreate it. It's to recreate it in a way that is affordable, mm. recreate it in a way that hits the right uh, transparency. Is it organic? Is it NGP? Is it synthetic? Is it natural? So the difficulty is not so much in the experience, but what's behind that experience that's underpinning why somebody's going for this product or why we're doing this from a culinary standpoint. Right. Mm -hmm. that, so when you're talking about emulating meats, right? So we really, we, we sort of touched on herring, right? pickled herring, mm -hmm. what the flavor of that is, mm -hmm. trying to understand it. But I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, in terms of connecting with, so certain consumers are backing out of uh, their meat consumption mm -hmm. because they're told that it's much better for you to yeah. replace. Less red meat. Yeah. So, in which then you're trying to articulate the flavor of that mm. in something that doesn't have meat in it. Yeah. So there's that side. Then there's the other side, though. There's vegans, maybe, like just from birth. They just never ate meat. Mm. I'm sure there's some. Yeah. And they have maybe a fascination with what meat tastes like. So you mm -hmm. could talk to them. And then some wouldn't want to know at all, mm -hmm. right? And it's, it's just such a... Um, there's such a divide in a way, mm -hmm. and that's why you're specializing for each product that you work with. Mm -hmm. You know, every every different one has a different need and is trying mm -hmm. to communicate. So, what's been in vogue right now has been making vegetable, uh, plant-based things taste like meat. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you connect with that doesn't? That is really working on maybe a different flavor. Um, connecting something different you know I mean I, that's a big question and sure. it would also depend on what how lately you've been to the grocery store yeah. and how much you want to share yeah because um, I can't answer it actually myself. yeah I mean I, you know from a personal level that's yeah. the way I can explain I mean I've seen things where you have a lot of the condiments I think the egg is probably the next thing it's right. not traditionally meat but if you're following that lifestyle and that, that choice of going vegan 
you know, being able to have a mayonnaise or to have eggs or even have baked goods because eggs is a big part of baking. Mm. Pasta, uh, and certain types of pastas and, and, and cooking and how do you offer that at an ingredient level to give you something that's comparable but still the, the, the properties that are needed for you know, the cooking or just to, to scramble it together and make it even look like that. So for me, I would say from a personal level, that's probably one area that, that you can see products that, that fit that, that realm. Yeah, I would think like more dairy as well, like yeah. cheeses and even Absolutely, the cheeses mm -hmm. for sure too. Mm -hmm. right? Because people like cheese. And, oh my but, God. And, 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 and oh, it, yes. this is also hitting the people that like cheese, but for... Uh, physical reasons and for medical reasons can't process cheese. Right. So how do you offer that too? And this is actually an opportunity to give an alternative to milk that has a higher nutritional value. Because one of the benefits of milk is also the protein content. And you have some of the alternative milks out there. We're talking coconut, we're talking almond. Uh, soy is a little bit different, but mm -hmm. they tend to be less in protein content. So you right. still get the milk-like experience, but you may not get all of the mm -hmm. nutrients that you would expect out of the animal-based milk. Mm, yes. Would you say that um, flavors and fragrances are really seeds to the memory? Yes. Yeah, so that's a, that's a huge part of it and everybody has a unique relationship because when you were asking about the vanilla, mm -hmm. I remember standing at the booth and seeing those tubes mm -hmm. and you had those, the cotton, well, it seemed like cotton balls or whatever that had the... Gumballs. They were what? Gumballs? Yeah, oh, they were gumballs. Gum gumballs. They were gumballs. For some reason, yeah. I remember them as cotton balls. <laughs> And but, a few people almost try to eat them. Like, no, 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 no. This is for voting purposes. I mean, right. you could eat them, but we're like, but no, you don't want to do that. You don't yeah. want to do that. So Especially that, when everybody's put their hand in that bag, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's that's the thing, though. Like, if I had no reference for what vanilla was, it would evoke something. So you were saying, like, yeah. it's you're trying to articulate and understand and express it, yeah. but you guys know exactly what you're trying to push, right? Yes. Because yeah. yeah, it's it's. I mean, and endlessly we, fascinating. And then we watch what's the response. Right. Why do you like it? Why don't you like it? And it was a very simple straw poll at the time, but it gave us perspective of, hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. And that's information translates back. And how do we tune in on? Well, why does this consumer like this more? and this less well and just between the grilled and the roasted the roasted had such a stronger flavor yeah. it was like oh you can't don't put your nose right in it yeah. right because it's... you can overdose it <laughs> yes yes so there is a component of that right just the, the 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 strength of the aroma yes you know is part of it yeah i, I have a question i started writing it down but i might as well just ask it because i keep forgetting it fermentation is huge yes right so is there a flavor uh, and fragrance that is attributable to fermentation. Okay, maybe if you can, in what context, just so I understand. Yeah, no, so that. I mean, in the context of, I, I guess I was thinking about um, cheese. Okay. Right, so when cheese goes through the process where the bacteria or the fungi, you know, F, it starts to grow mm -hmm. and it's almost like it's getting fermented, right? Mm -hmm. or, or maybe kimchi would be better. Right. Yeah. So kimchi, Kombucha. oftentimes mm -hmm. you're adding fish to it, but sometimes not. Mm -hmm. But it's going through a process of fermentation, mm -hmm. which gases are released. Right. Yeah. And then what is it? The umami that's being, um, you know, blooming or what what specifically about fermentation could be a particular thing? Or is uh, it dependent yeah. upon what you're fermenting? Yeah, it's depending on what you're fermenting. Yes. Right. I mean. Wine is fermented, beer is fermented, you so go. you have a completely different different animal and spectrum. So in that case, it really depends on what you're going for with that one. Fermentation is a long, has a long history, yes, and long use. And there's not a specific flavor associated with it. It really is what you do with it. It's what you do with it, and what where the flavor comes from is as the fermentation process progresses. Right. It's making all kinds of molecules. So you'll have some things that are give you a characteristic notes, there'll be acids, there might be alcohol, obviously is the biggest fermentation product, but if you know from even, if you're looking at whiskeys or anything mm -hmm. else, they imbue some of the characteristic notes that can even be absorbed through uh, the way you're fermenting things, converting, you know, you can get vanilla, you can get sweet things, you can, it's just 
there's a whole spectrum of what gets produced through those. Well, like uh, I was thinking of kombucha bowls. too, as yeah. you know, there's so many different flavors. And, Absolutely. Yeah. And some of those are added in and some of those are part of the product. Yeah. Right. So I went to Momofuku, which is a David Chang's restaurant, mm-hmm. like a bunch of years ago and ordered the pickle plate. Mm-hmm. In which there was shiitake that was pickled, which I had mm. never had. Different radishes, mm. more common things. So pickling is fermentation, right? Is it? It's it's not. It's no. Pickling? It, okay. It, so then let's forget about that. Let's just talk <laughs> about pickling for a second. Okay. But pickling. Yeah. It, definitely, definitively, those things had their own tastes and flavors, but they also were brought to this certain place of being pickled. Mm -hmm. That was this je ne sais quoi, you know? I didn't know what it was, but it was fantastic. There was a commonality of those things being pickled. So what, why, what, how, help? It's it's really about a taste, because pickling was there to preserve something. And if you look at the way, for instance, the Indian culture pickles and what they call pickles and what Western calls pickles, completely different, but the goal was to preserve products so that way we can have it available whenever we needed to, especially through climate, winters, and things along those lines. So it imbues taste attributes. So you're talking about sweet, you're talking sour, you're getting bitterness, you're getting herbal qualities, and depending on how you brine or pickle something, you're really infusing it. So think of pickling more of an infusion. And you're infusing it to protect the core product, but also brings on the flavor of what you're infusing it with. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that would be, d- it would depend on what their recipe is. I do believe I have the cookbook <laughs> that has those pickling recipes. So I'm curious if it's just applying one level of pickling to all of those things or if they're different, you know? It could be definitely worth looking in there. Yeah. What, what's there? I mean, obviously there is a bit of a fermentation process, I'm sure. Right. But the whole point of preserving it is so that you don't, you know, spoil the food. Right. right. I was going to say, it's almost like, you know, over time, it it, 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 it yeah. brines or whatever, ha- you know, yeah. you want to say. And right? But but it's different than dehydrating, for example. So you could dehydrate to preserve, but that's not something that evokes or infuses. It just kind of... You pull water away. Yeah. So, so what you're doing is you're making it inhospitable for the organisms to break and spoil your food. Right. right. So on one hand, you're also making it inhospitable, but in a liquid form. And the other one, you're doing it in a dry form right right but then there's like almost a point at which you when you dry things you're kind of taking this the smell away right? yes you lose taste and smell you're losing taste and smell for sure okay but otherwise you're... it becomes a leather shoe a very salty Ooh, leather shoe yeah <laughs> i've had one of those <laughs> it evokes that charlie chaplin right with the with the where he was eating the shoe right <laughs> huh. Interesting. Very interesting. <laughs> so very interesting. Um, uh, that I, I think one of the questions that Olivia did have that I didn't ask yet was just about um, umami. Is it is it really worth all the hype that has been given to it recently in the press? Well, I mean, first of all, umami is considered a basic taste. So there is a receptor. There's a scientific explanation. There is something that hits that receptor, evokes a signal, and reinforces that behavior in the brain. So Fundamentally, it is a basic taste. Now, how umami is defined in terms of, you know, you can say MSG hits it there, things high in glutamic acid, things in uh, ribonucleotides, things associated with meats, right? Mm -hmm. Because ribonucleotides are uh, DNA, which are the backbone of a lot of protein, uh, uh, part of proteins and cells. So you can see where evolutionally it, it, it helped contribute to desire to consume meat because of amino acids and those proteins because there's nine essential amino acids that we have to get through our diet and meat kind of fits a lot of those where some of the alternatives depending on which ones you are fall short in the ratios to to really develop uh, into uh, you know healthy bone growth brain activity function so that umami helps reinforce the need to go for that i call it the inner carnivore Right, but there is something there from a richness, a savory, a fattiness, all of that placed together to make that a desirable taste because your brain is thinking this is probably pretty nutritious. 
we need to have more of this. Right. Some yeah. people call it earthy. It's like right. really identifying that flavor is, is tough yeah. to put into words. Well, I mean, if you're thinking about it in a very simple way, MSG, if you want it, or seaweed. seaweed. Seaweed is your classic umami, uh, very Asian. But you also get a umami quality from you know, meat from stews, from beef or marrow and things along those lines. Yeah, koji is one that we were talking to Wild Earth and they make pet food out of uh, koji, fermented and and synthesized. And the, the thing is, is that mushrooms from the perspective of what one of the scientists was saying was they're closer um, to actually animal cells than they are to plant cells. Hmm. So that, that figured in uh, pretty amazingly, um, which also made me think of a question, what is the hardiest flavor? So a flavor that has longevity in and of itself. Hmm. That's a good question. I uh, haven't thought of it, which one has a longevity. I mean, is it long lasting or... Or is it a de depth and richness? Because right, it can mean different things. It can right. actually mean different things. Well, let's just say that if I left something, see that it's about edibility too, right? So it, it cues into our need to our survival instincts. You don't want something that's going to taste like a cookie forever, but that's yeah. not natural. Let's see, a na that's. Yeah. Well, that's why like meat tends to, you know, I mean, only lasts so long, right? And right. then it, it takes on a <laughs> rotten. Well, a whole different characteristic of its own. Right. But an herb, though, let's yeah. say that, that grows like French sorrel, yeah. which is this incredible lemony taste, yeah. right? So that's growing. It's the lifespan of the plant will always taste like that until the plant dies. Sure. But you got to remember, herbs are there more for palatability. They're a seasoning. They're, they're a way to help mask or make something taste better why right? did they or er, they added herbs to certain meats or 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 certain type of uh, dishes is to make them more exciting for the consumer experience right our experience herbs don't have that many nutritional values that compare into the, to the macro and you're not you're not just eating rosemary or or thyme all the time you know right. like directly right, right. right rosemary carnivore no <laughs> no no it's that inner, inner rosemary. <laughs> rosemary. Can't get rosemary. enough of it. That thyme. Oof. Right? So but it's, uh, it, it really was there to accent and make something more palatable. And in most cases, it was probably applied to a lots of meat because at that point, if you think from a culinary standpoint, you don't know how, that, how long that meat's been there and it's still probably safe, but not as uh, palatable as it was when it was freshly produced. Right. right. But maybe those were some of the first toolkits that human beings had to almost be an IFF. Yes. And we actually still inspire ourselves from that same toolkit because that hasn't changed. Yeah. Right. How many of us have an herb garden or an right. easy access to, to herbs? Right. I mean, we grow stuff. I grow stuff at, at home all the time, and whatever I can at the recipe, I'll snip it off just to just to add it and put it into a, a turkey. And uh, I'm still the carnivore, right? But put it into a turkey or, or mix it in with a with a pork loin or something along those lines. I mean, it's there. Yeah. Yeah. Adds a whole different thing. And, and, it, and it makes a whole different experience, mm -hmm. and culturally. You know, you, you look at the Eastern cultures, you'll have those that put in spices. They're not doing it in meat, but they're adding spices to really accent a taste experience to make it more exciting, more desirable, right? You have, a, if you look at the Indian culture, a lot of strong, bold flavors, spicy, and there, a lot of it is lentils. A lot of it is a, a vegetarian or vegan aspect to it, mm -hmm. or a good portion of that diet. And I bet those flavors have some longevity. Yes. yes. <laughs> right. Well, that, that's, so that's very interesting. It just brings me to one other question. Um, and I've heard this referenced a few times and don't have numbers. Okay. But they were talking about, somebody was talking about plant-based and that proteins right now, so there's soy, Mm -hmm. And now right now is very popular as pea protein, mm -hmm. but the actual research and studies into it as a classification to understand heightening the protein and bringing it out culinarily, there is remains so unexplored. We're at the tip of beginning to do that, and which is so very exciting. Yeah. I know that if I, lentils, for example, I, it's a beautiful flavor to me mm -hmm. and a very powerful and evocative flavor, mm -hmm. but it's not been put on that like level and scale. And once that happens, 
who knows what's going to happen. So exciting. And then you guys come in and, and, and interpret, reinterpret, augment. Do you, do you um, envision that that new research will then you know, align you with more thoughts and process and research? Well, yeah, and that's one of the reasons I was at the, the summit, right? To yeah. see what is coming out there. Yes. What's the new, what is the new cutting edge research and how do we incorporate our big bets and our bold um, approach to this innovation and think of where, where can we play here? And is this going to be the next generation from, you know, we're growing it and now we're fermenting it to some extent. And now how are we going to ferment it more efficiently in the future? And we haven't even touched the whole aspect of we're talking plant based. What's about the cultured meat part of it? Right. Ooh, where where does yes. that fit into play? And, you know, growing, growing meat, not from an animal, but from a fermentation broth. It, you know, and where does that fit in terms of the needs, the desire, and the market? Yeah. Yeah, cellular agriculture. It's everybody. It's this thing that hasn't yet completely happened. Yeah. But that's happening. Yeah. And um, and it's it it has so many allusions to science fiction, because truly it is science. But take the fiction away now. Yeah. Um. Well, it's no Just different what? than printing food. Right? I no, was say. not necessarily so, right? Yeah. So, I mean, that is the only way, I suppose, that we will be able to go beyond Mars. Yeah. To be a spacefaring people is to be able to synthesize our food and grow it yeah. on, a, on a cellular level. So, would well, you... Well, you don't even have to go to Mars. I mean, if yeah. you think about back to the sustainability. I mean, yes. If, if the estimates are saying by 2030, we're going to be a billion more people... Well, the planet's not expanding, right? Yeah, that's right. And by 2050, estimates are saying totally we're going to be 10 billion on, on this limited space. Yeah. We may not have to go to Mars to start printing. We may have to think of other ways to be able to support and sustain that. Right. right? So I think there's going to be two motivations. Our needs. Our period. needs. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, so one more... You were saying, so you're chemistry, you're a yes. chemist. Okay. Yeah. So, and this comes from me not understanding the difference between um, chemistry, mm -hmm. right, and physics, right? Okay. So the level of the atomic level, mm -hmm. how much can you manipulate uh, or create or, uh, a smell or a fragrance on the atomic level versus the, the, the level of chemistry? Uh, well, the, the big difference, just to define it, yeah. if you're saying physics is on the individual atoms, molecular, yes. atomic level, those are just elements. Right. And the study of those properties and how those work in space and vacuum and what else is out there to discover. Chemistry is combinations of these molecules and how they interact with other combinations of molecules. So it's really about the interaction between groups of atoms to create or change form into something else. So in physics, you typically don't necessarily create something new. It's really the fundamental study of the basic part of it on a quantum level. Chemistry, you're changing matter and transforming it into something else. So that's the key difference there. And it's the study of how those transformations happen. So when we say organic chemist, it's primarily to do with you know chemistry of carbon, which is the basis of all our life, whether it's plant, you know, insect, microbial, human, and how does that carbon interact with other molecules like hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and work together to create, let's say, life or create things as interesting as flavors or fragrances and those build off and, and can be used in some fashion or some way. Yeah, recently there was a film and I can't remember the name of it, but suddenly the aliens appear <laughs> and they're trying to communicate with them. Yeah. So they bring in a language specialist. Oh yeah, I know right? what you're talking about. No, no, no. Okay, so they bring in a language specialist who's trying to understand what are they telling us? What are we telling them, right? I think maybe they should have brought one of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just say that. I'm not, I'm not even jesting. I think, although it wouldn't straddle 
an extraterrestrial experience of what smell and taste is and yeah. if they would have those receptors, but it certainly is being very aware of what your experience is. Yes. Yes. So. And that's why if you look at flavors and fragrances and you think, well, well, those things sort of are the same, but why the same? It makes sense because it's a experience and translating that experience into a way that could be easily obtained. Yeah packaged and experienced multiple times mm -hmm. so it's about the convenience it's tuning into that emotion and you can perceivably see the leap of beyond uh, you mentioned before being spatially aware of where you are how does that all play light sound smell taste because that's what we experience in the real world and can you translate that into something that helps evoke those emotions and gives the experience you're looking for that excites you when you're tasting a product or uh, drinking something or simply just putting on clothes if you have the fragrance from a detergent to make it clean, but it brings you back somewhere. Oh, right? absolutely. Such an experience. I mean, yeah. it really is. Yeah, and that the hard part is taking that experience and translating that into something that is you know tangible mm -hmm. workable molecular level and how you bring it all together it's that science and art again <laughs> yes yes the fusion for sure yeah there's a museum um i think it, it's a harvard museum the fog museum right that that's their fine arts but they also have a color museum yeah. um i think they're attached whatever and so they bring they have all of these jars full of color that was made in some of the strangest ways. Uh, the history of which is like has to do with really kind of much older practices of synthesizing things, some ways that we would never do or allow today. Um, I wonder with you know flavors, fragrances, with that art form, mm -hmm. is there like a similar repository, you know, a history? Hmm. Um, I mean, I guess it's the history of chemistry, right? Yeah. But. Well, there's, I mean, the chemistry is the way to get to those molecules or to get to that experience, right? So it's, a, again, a vehicle and an enabler. Um, well, actually, I don't know if there's anything like that. I mean, we have bits and pockets and everybody kind of has their own collection. But to, to like, have a flavor and fragrance museum, I haven't heard of it. Either. Interesting. It'd be interesting to like have that throughout the years too and how the flavors have changed and yeah what's the evolution yeah and yeah. we kind of yeah, definitely we'll have, but to, I, we'll have to think of that we'll have to think of that <laughs> but, but actually sometimes it's funny because if you you know you do a bit of a retrospect and you're thinking you know where are we today and where we were 20 years ago 30 years ago you know chemistry we was in and as again as a scientist i'm happy to see chemistry was in but we went from a purely synthetic world digital mm. trying to now evoke back to the you know the the table the home cook and evolve it's almost i don't want to even say it's evolving it's going back to this whole farm to fork where before that's the only way you right. can get the it's food, went right? full circle. right we're full yeah. circle. we're full circle right we want to go back to that. There's a, I don't want to even call it a nostalgia. Oh, there is. Uh -huh, Mofad. There you go. Mofad. Ooh, cool. Yeah. Oh, food and drink. Wow. Okay. Awesome. That's something I didn't know. Okay. All right, road trip. Okay. <laughs> is it someplace exotic? Brooklyn. Oh. Brooklyn, we can that's make it there. That's pretty good. You can say that's exotic depending on where you're from. Yes. Maybe, maybe that's where the next uh, protein show happened. <laughs> wow. Okay. So, but uh, yeah, so it's, it's coming full circle. It is. It is. Absolutely. Well, it's it's been fascinating. It really has. Good. It's been such a pleasure. I mean, thank, thank you for inviting us here and and taking the time with us because I mean I know it just gets me so excited that I get ridiculous. Well, and just learning all the intricacies yeah. of the, your business and how it fits into this new landscape has been yes fascinating. Yeah, well, it's it's that one of those things behind the scenes. It's not one thing I wake up and saying, okay, I'm gonna find myself in a career with flavor and fragrances you know right like, oh, it's certainly a specialty <laughs> yeah wow that's really interesting but you know i even just recall from my time of in uh, of the uh interviewing with uh, for the process and this was many years ago and you know you're pharmaceutically trained you're a chemist you're making drugs you're you're curing you know curing things and said all right i'll sit down and have this conversation and what fascinated me is not only that 
the technical challenge is still there. It's stimulating, but you see a practical output. It may not be as altruistic in a sense as you know curing a disease, but it is about impacting a quality of life, whether it's a fragrance or a flavor. So in the end, it is about the human, the human factor and balancing a well-being that in the end should have a positive influence on how we live. So in a sense, I'm like, wow, that's kind of cool. Yeah, very. Well, it's not exactly what I started out <laughs> in my career to do, but translating that passion, that, that knowledge, that expertise, and in a way that is a little bit more satisfying in a sense because it's a bit more tangible. You can see where you've contributed to the market, where we've made an impact, and where people are more than just excited because you're also to help enable healthier products, either protein or or you know less sugar, salt, or fat, or or even making you know greener detergents and and, and soaps, and people are going to be cleaner, clothes are, are are fresher, and and you can do that with less water. And the, all of that just means you, you you can have an impact in that way. So that's, that's oh kind definitely of that. yes yeah. It's really about creating the opportunity for people to be able to create these products that yeah. make our world a better place. For sure. We'd like to thank Adam Yanzik as well as Erica and Carol and everybody else at IFF for allowing us to come into your facility and they actually had some nice setup there for us we had some cookies and some coffee two staples that kept us going without of which we would not have been able to pull this off and if you'd like to know more visit iff.com as well as our website, brandfirstnj.com. Thank you so much.